Good morning. Let me begin by welcoming Charlotte Staples, cello, and Harris McSheevy, piano, who are uh, replacing Jeff for today. Uh, Jeff and his uh, choir camarada are out in Edmonton. So we are grateful both to Charlotte and to Harris for playing for us today. I welcome those of you who don't normally worship here. I see some folks who are uh, visiting family and some folks who are here just visiting. So uh, welcome to all of you. And welcome too to those of you that are watching us on a television screen or viewing us on a tablet or laptop screen. In the bulletin, you'll find the June congregational calendar. And uh, you can also access that from our website. You'll find uh, all the dates and happenings for June in that document. We extend our sympathies to Brian Trenholm on the death of his sister Nancy MacDonald of Bedeck. And this afternoon, the Amos Regional High School Band and Choir Concert takes place at two o'clock. And later this month on Sunday, June the 18th at 6.30 p.m. So it's Sunday, June the 18th at 6.30 p.m. There's a service to recognize not the closing of the congregation at Emmanuel, but the closing of the Emmanuel uh, United Church building on Hickman Street. So that's uh, 6.30 on Sunday, the 18th of June. A chance to, a chance to uh, gather with folks at Emmanuel and to mark that passing. All are welcome. Would you pause with me now for a few moments in which to reflect silently and to prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies for worship. Let's join together as we seated sing the introit, God is the one. if we could sing that one more time in just a second. Uh, so this is our third week of doing this. And uh, this Sunday, we don't have to try to sing above the organ, uh, but we do have to try to sing above the piano. And uh, that's uh, maybe good practice. So let's try this one more time with a, uh, a bit of uh, diaphragm support and stuff like that. wish to follow along, the reading is printed 
in the bulletin. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they all met in one room. Suddenly, they heard what sounded like a violent rushing wind from heaven. The noise filled the entire house in which they were sitting. Something appeared to them that seemed like tongues of fire. They separated and came to rest on the head of each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as she enabled them. Now, there were devout people living in Jerusalem from under every nation under heaven. And at this sound they all assembled, but they were bewildered to hear their native languages being spoken. They were amazed and astonished. Surely all these people speaking are Galileans. How does it happen that each of us hears these words in our native tongue? We are Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, as well as visitors from Rome, all Jews or converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs too. We hear them preaching each in our own language about the marvels of God. All were amazed and disturbed. They asked each other, what does this mean? But others said mockingly, they've drunk too much new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and addressed the crowd. No, it's what Joel the prophet spoke of. In the days to come, it is our God who speaks. I will pour out my spirit on all humankind. Let us stand together. God, today we remember your promise of old that a day is coming when you will pour out your spirit. 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 That day is this day, and this day that. Our opening hymn is number 198 in the red hymn book that you'll find in the pew in front of you or on the screen. 198, Come, O Spirit.
Let's pray together. Spirit, you come in wind and flame, blowing where you will, a constant dance of shifting energy, warmth and light, and the fiery heat of passion. Forgive us for our need to control, our desire to manipulate, our schemes to harness your spirit wind. Forgive us our coldness toward you, toward others, our reluctance to live in your light, our shy refusal to join your dance, our holding ourselves back from your passion. Forgive us and burn within us yet, we pray. Amen. Jesus breathed on them and said, If you forgive someone's sins, they are gone for good. That we may be forgiven and forgiving. Jesus stood among them and said, The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to turn to those nearby or far away and exchange words of peace and welcome. present ourselves and our offerings with prayer and praise. Let us pray. Holy love, you are the source, the goal, the context for all that is. In you we are born and in you we have our living. Not even the ice cold grip of death can snatch us from your embrace. May we know ourselves held in you and may we remember that you hold all else too, that we might grow in our love of humanity and our care of your whole creation. Amen. We're doing things a little differently this morning. We're not just having a, a quick sung number to bring the offering up on. Uh, we're gonna sing a whole psalm that uh, is gonna save us a little time later. You'll find the psalm printed in the bulletin. It'll also be on the screen. 
So those who are bringing the offering uh, to the front could do that on the first verse and just go back and the rest of us will keep standing and singing. So let's stand and sing together. Uh, Harris will play th the verse through once for us. Okay, all right. from 1 Corinthians. There is a variety of gifts, but always the same spirit. There is a variety of ministries, but we serve the same one. There is a variety of outcomes, but the same God is working in all of them. To each person is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one, the Spirit gives wisdom in discourse. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Through the Spirit, one person receives faith. Through the same Spirit, another is given the gift of healing. And still another, miraculous powers. Prophecy is given to one, to another, the power to distinguish one spirit from another. One receives the gift of tongues, another that of interpreting tongues. But it is one and the same spirit who produces all these gifts and distributes them as she wills. 
that there may be no dissension in the body, but that all the members may be concerned for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members share its joy. You then are the body of Christ, and each of you is a member of it. Furthermore, God has set up in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracle workers, healers, assistants, administrators, <coughs> excuse me, and those who speak in tongues. <coughs> Set your heart on the greater gifts. But now I will show you the way which surpasses all the others. Even if I can speak in all the tongues of the earth and those of the angels too, but do not have love, I am just a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, such that I can comprehend all the mysteries and all knowledge, or if I have faith great enough to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own to feed those poorer than I, then hand over my body to be burned, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. There are, in the end, three things that last, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the good news, according to John. And greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted, Any who are thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Those who believe in me, as the scripture says, from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Here, Jesus was referring to the Spirit, which those who came to believe were to receive, though she had not yet been given, since Jesus had not been glorified. This is the good news of Jesus.
Thank you both. I hope you're uh, feeling in a uh, participatory mood this morning. I hope if I ask you a question, you'll, uh, some of you will voice an answer. It's a nice kind of question, an open question. There's no right or wrong answer. So you can't get it wrong. Here's, here's the question. Who is the most famous, noteworthy Canadian of the 20th century? Hmm? Terry Fox. Terry Fox, okay. See, so what you're beginning to do in your heads already is to analyze, right? See, so if we could break this down into categories, it would be easier. The greatest in terms of what? Sports? Politics? Science? Business? If we went with sports, we could say well how how the Havlich, he could go go on. But then someone would say Nancy Green. So we've done a bit more analysis, right? It's not just categories. Say, like, well, there's male and female. Maybe we need one of each from all these categories. Maybe it's uh, less to be Pearson and what he did in the diplomatic world. Maybe it's, uh, well, if it was in the world of theology, I don't know that's a very small world, the world of theology. The littlest c c category we might come up with. Canada has actually produced one world class theologian. Somebody that the church in the Western world would have no problem saying, yes, this is a great. A name I know is on the tip of every tongue. Roman Catholic theologian called Bernard Lonergan he was born in 1904 and died in 1984 was during his lifetime would be ranked among the top ten theologians in the Western world. He spent a lot of time talking about how we know and about the scientific method. Now we weren't that scientific in our survey, but we were beginning to do the kind of scientific thing of, of analyzing, of breaking down into parts, of, of comparing and contrasting and, and predicting. Lonergan said that when it came to the scientific method, there were three things that were required to be attentive, to be intelligent, and to be reasonable. I kind of like to think that those things could also apply to listening to a sermon too. Be attentive, be intelligent, be reasonable. He said we also need a fourth, 
Because as we have progressed in terms of our scientific knowledge to the point where we could do things which could destroy life as we know it, then we have to be responsible. We can no longer say we can do this because we can do it. We have to ask, is it the right thing? Is it the responsible thing to do? Be attentive. Pay attention to the data. Be intelligent. Understand the data. Be reasonable. Formulate a theory. And when you've done all that and when you know, be responsible. The knowledge that we gain takes us beyond ourselves. It's a way in which we transcend ourselves. And yet, Lonergan said, even these four things are not enough. They have to be complemented by love. Because while these things may increase our knowledge, they in and of themselves and the knowledge gained can't lead us to true self-transcendence. It can't increase our full humanity, the humanity that God intends for us. It might lead to knowledge, but it does not lead to wisdom unless it's complemented by love. So it is that in his later years, Lonergan, who despite, or perhaps because of being, one of the top theologians in the world, was said to write, and I quote, dull, dense, and highly technical theology. Now some of you might think that all theology by definition is dull and dense, but it's not. Having written very technical, very detailed, very analytical theology, theology that in its own way bore out and followed the scientific method. Lonergan became interested in love and in mysticism. So in later years he wrote that the capacity for self-transcendence becomes an actuality when one falls in love. Then one's being becomes being in love. From it flow one's desires and fears, one's joys and sorrows, one's discernment of values, one's decisions and deeds. Can you remember falling in love? Has it been that long? <laughs> Just that phrase, falling in love, is an interesting thing, isn't it? You fall in love, and yet when you've fallen in love, it seems to me, if I remember correctly, <laughs> you're floating. Right? Your feet are a little bit off the ground. You're dancing on sunshine. It's the old pop song used to have it. The world looks a nicer place. You're a nicer person. I have been at my best when I have been in love. I'm not sure I was really that different, but you just feel for some people, falling in love is such a great thing that they do it over and over and over and over. <laughs> Most of us figure out that after a while, 
what's even better than falling in love is being in love. And I'd like to think that for those of you that couldn't remember falling in love, that's perhaps because you are still being in love. Lonergan says that being in love is what leads beyond knowledge towards wisdom. Because love is a different kind of knowing. Love enables us to know what isn't knowable in the sense of rationally knowable. Love makes no sense. Those of you who are sitting next to the person you love might just take a moment and look at that person and realize why I'm with this person is probably a bit of a mystery, even to me. <laughs> love doesn't deal with knowledge as science does. It deals with the wisdom that is mystery. Blaise Pascal wrote, that the heart has its reasons, that reason does not know. I quote much beloved of Lonergan in his old age. So Lonergan says that we're to be about being in love. And that's what Paul said too, wasn't it? You wanna, want me to, to show you the very best gift of all. That gift is love. That gift is being in love. We didn't read Paul's description of love, but many of you can remember phrases from that description. Love doesn't seek to have its own way. Love doesn't rejoice to see evil done, but rejoices in the good. Love doesn't think the worst. Love doesn't keep score. Although we read that at weddings, and I think there's a tendency for bride and groom or bride and bride or groom and groom to uh, think that that's their love. It really isn't. The love that Paul is describing first and foremost is the love of God with which we are loved. God is the one who doesn't keep score. Let me say that again for those of you who fear that when you die, the first thing that's gonna happen is God is gonna open a big scorebook and tell you how many check marks you have and how many X's. God does not keep score. God does not always look out for God's self-interest first. We know that because in Jesus we see God with us. We see that love. A love that is only ever self-giving. Monaghan says we need to live being in love in order to be with the one who is being in love. God is being in love. God is love in being. And as much as we are able to give ourselves to being in love, we become one with the one who is being in love. Heart to heart. Or as Jesus said again and again in John's Gospel, you in me and I in you and together in the Father. 
You in me and I in you. To people who thirsted to be all that God intended them to be. To people who thirsted for being in love. Who thirsted to know as they are known. And Jesus promised that if they came to him, he would be in them. A life-giving fountain. That love would flow. That love would flow in them and through them. That's why the sermon title is called Regifting. The gifts that each of us receives, the love with which each of us, in which each of us dwells, and which dwells in us, is not just for us, but for all. Imagine what it would be like if all the love of God that was available to us came pouring out of all of us, like some bubbling fountain. Imagine if we were awash in love. Trinity St. Stephen's, awash in love. That you had to wade knee deep through water to come to a pew and to sit. Imagine if all those who were thirsty knew that here there was a fountain. Free to all, for all. In which being in love was indeed the state of being. So may that be true for us on this Pentecost Sunday. A Sunday in which the Spirit comes to dwell in us, upon us, and among us. Amen. Let's sing together number 384 in the Red Hymn Book. This isn't a hymn that we sing often, but it's a uh, a tune from the Southern Harmony, uh, from the Appalachian. So it's, uh, it's got a kind of Celtic feel to it that should work for us in this Celtic part of the world. And number 384, The Lone Wild Bird. <laughs>
Oh God. Last night news broke of terror attacks again in England. Terror attacks around the world. And so we would sing those words asking for your spirit to come and to rest within. We would pray them not just for ourselves, but for the creation of the peoples of this world. For those who can find no being in love, but forge your being in hate. For them, we ask, we remind you of your promise and of your demonstration in the resurrection of Jesus, that love is more powerful than hatred or death. That when all is said and done, when all things come to their fulfillment and find completion, that in the end, love is all there is. Love is all that has ever been. For all the hatred and all the fear and all the anger and all the sorrow and all the guilt will have been purged from us. So it is that we pray, asking you to so send your spirit that our thirst for justice, our thirst for belonging, our thirst for you, our thirst to know ourselves. Amen. That we might be a people awash in your love, with love and love to spare, with love and love to give away, with love and love who re-gift each other. In these summer months, we thank you for those who will visit. Some as tourists, some to come home to family. And we thank you for the opportunities to rest, to recreate. By the shore, in a book, traveling ourselves. We thank you for those who write words and music and for those who play. We thank you for all your good gifts.
help us. To be attentive. To be intelligent. To be reasonable. To be responsible. To have all that we say and do and think. Complemented by love. For we turn to you. Who love us with the love of a strong and capable mother, a tender and caring father. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 375 in the Red Hymn Book, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness.
you remember when Jesus said to his followers, I'm going to have to leave you. Things are going to have to change, but if I leave you, one will come. The spirit that was in me will be in all of you. So it is that we take this one flame and change it into that which billows out, to that which is unseen, to that which blows where it will. And where it wills to blow is on you and in you. And it's there. For it is as we dare to believe that that spirit is in us and with us that we will discover the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Creator and the companionship, the comfort and the challenge that is the spirit with us and with others now and forever. Amen.